LEX webinar, RDA for Copy Catalogers, The Basics. I'm Eva Sorrell, a member of the LEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Vicki Seip, Catalog Librarian at the Alvin O. Kuhn Library and Gallery of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Prior to her 11 years at the University of Maryland, she worked as a librarian in federal libraries. Recently, Vicki wrote the Alex Fundamentals of Cataloging web course and is one of several instructors for the course. She is the president-elect President elect of Alex. Her presentation will discuss the application of specific RDA guidelines and the creation of bibliographic description through the use of excerpts from RDA, sample title pages, and sample bibliographic records. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Vicki, please type them into the question box on your screen and she will answer them as time permits at the end of her presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we were on the air will be answered offline and the answer sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Please take time to fill out the evaluation form since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Vicki. Okay, um, thank you, Eva. You should have my screen, I believe. Yes, we see your screen. Okay, great. So, um, uh, thank you, Eva, and I'd like to thank Alex for sponsoring this webinar and the Alex staff and the Alex Continuing Education Committee for making this webinar possible. So this is me, Vicki Seip, your presenter for today, and I'd like to welcome you. This gives you kind of a face to the voice in case you need one or would like one. So the use of different data content standards, such as AACR2 and RDA, can result in bibliographic records that describe the same resource in different ways, records that look different but describe the same resource. Here we have a title page for a book entitled Graven Images. On the left is a marked bibliographic description created using AACR2. On the right, a description based on RDA. There are many differences in the content of the marked fields and even different marked fields between the two records. As you can see, we have 260s and 264s in some and not in others. We have 336s and 337s, 338s. So quite a few differences between the two but both of them describe the same title page, the same resource, each in their own way. These differences in description and the records that result are what we'll be talking about today. So here's a brief agenda. I want to talk first a little bit about the transition from AAC to RDA. Then we're going to take a quick stop with Ferber and discuss the entity relationship model since it's so important to RDA. And then we're going to move right into RDA, some of the basics, um, some of the basic background things that I think are important to understand about RDA overall. And then we're going to launch into a section presenting variations in bibliographic records, a section on descriptive elements first, and then access points relationships. So that's going to be what we're up to today. First off, resource description and access, RDA, began life as AACR3. It was envisioned as an update and revision of AACR2. Along the way, it became important to integrate the model of Ferber, the functional requirements for bibliographic records, into the new con con uh, excuse me, cataloging content standard. It became something of a, a central focus, and RDA was actually totally reorganized around this. By December of 2005, the first draft of RDA Part 1 was released for comment. And testing by various institutions ran from 2010 to 2011. By March of 2013, the Library of Congress had implemented RDA with other institutions following suit. So RDA is built on AACR2. That means it's not entirely new or totally unfamiliar. 
both RDA and ACO2 are data content standards. They tell us what data to look for and to identify a bibliographic resource and how to record it in a record. But RDA is organized around the entity relationship data model developed in FERBER. So though RDA is related to AACR2, it's not AACR2. RDA is an attempt to view the world through Ferber colored glasses, and it's a database entity model that is focused on relationships. There's also an emphasis on machine actionable data, frequently using standard language or coded values in fields as opposed to free text. And compared to AACR2, RDA increases the granularity of data. It makes finer distinctions in many areas, and it adds totally new elements to description. So since Ferber is so important to RDA, let's take a look at some of the basics. Ferber uses an entity relationship model to represent the information in a bibliographic record. This diagram represents the basic building blocks of the model. Entities are identified here as rectangles, diamonds are relationships between entities, and ovals are attributes. This form of data modeling is quite common in relational database design, and you might have seen some of it there. Ferber identifies the objects of interest to users of bibliographic records. These become the entities in the model. Relationships between entities were identified in the report, and then characteristics that define the entities and the relationships were identified. These characteristics are the attributes of both relationships and entities. The model then is complete with these three parts, entities, relationships, and attributes. The entities are divided into three groups. Group one entities here on the left are the, basically they're the things that are described in bibliographic records. We consider them to be four, we call them work, expression, manifestation, and item. Group two entities are, when you boil it down, the creators of the things. And there are three of these. There's person, family, and corporate body. And finally, we have the group three entities. These are the things about things. These things are of four types, concept, object, event, and place. This diagram from Ferber shows the group one entities, the things we're describing, and the relationships between them. RDA spends a lot of time with the group one entities, so we're going to look at this diagram a little more closely. First off, a work is an abstract entity. It's an idea, a distinct intellectual or artistic creation. It's when Toni Morrison has the idea of Song of Solomon still abstract, it's still just a thought in her head. A work is realized through an expression. An expression is the idea of the work in a form. It's still abstract though. So it would be the idea of Song of Solomon in English or as a recorded reading or in translation into French or Spanish. Each of these is an expression of the work but they're all still abstract. When the expression takes a physical form you have a manifestation. When an expression, an abstract idea, is embodied in a physical form, it becomes a manifestation. The abstract idea has become a physical, tangible bunch of things, such as the Knopf edition from 1997, a French edition from 1994, and a Spanish edition from 2013. Here the editions are represented by covers, but the manifestation itself consists of all the thousands of copies of the book that make up the edition a physical, tangible bunch of things, all with the same attributes and relationships. As they're members of the edition, they all have these in common. And finally, we come down to the item. When you hold a single copy of the book in your hand, you now have an item. The manifestation is exemplified by that item. In this case, the manifestation of the Song of Solomon as the Knopf first edition of 1977 is here exemplified by this item on the right, which is not only an exemplar of the manifestation, the Knopf first edition of 1977, but it's also a very singular item in that it's autographed by Toni Morrison. So that, in a nutshell, is the Ferber model. So let's go back to our earlier diagram in the example. 
the relationship between our Song of Solomon manifestation and Knopf and some of the attributes can be represented by a diagram. The Group 1 Entity Manifestation, Song of Solomon, has attributes of addition and publication date. Song of Solomon has the relationship is produced by with Group 2 Entity, Knopf, and Knopf has attribute place, New York. This is all of it tied together in an entity relationship model. One of the reasons why it's important to understand at least the fundamentals of this is that RDA is organized around this model. And we can see this model of entities, relationships, and attributes throughout RDA. Here on the left is a table of contents from RDA. You can see the various sections listed. Entities appear throughout the table of contents. Here underlined in red are where the group one entities appear in RDA, the things that we describe in bibliographic records, the works, expressions, manifestations, and items. In section one, it covers the recording of the attributes of manifestations and items, and you can see as you go down further, work and expression also appear. Group two entities, the creators of the things, are underlined here in red. These are persons, families, and corporate bodies. They appear in section three, where the attributes of the entities are covered, as well, as well as several other places. And here you can see them all listed, persons, families, and corporate bodies appearing throughout. Group three entities, concepts, objects, events, and places, appear in several places in the table of contents, but many of these sections remain under development. One of the things to remember about RDA is that it's constantly being updated. Um, being the RDA toolkit and being an online um, an online animal, um, that's allowed and it also is very helpful to get things changed pretty quickly in response to questions or concerns. But it means that there are sections in RDA that are still being written and this concepts, objects, and events and places is one of those areas. Attributes of entities, another part of our Ferber data entity model, are covered in sections one through four and here you see them listed recording the attributes of the various uh, group one entities. Here is a detail of the attributes of manifestations and items. Much of the list consists of familiar characteristics, for example, title. Attributes are represented by elements in RDA. From the RDA glossary, an element is a word, character, group of words representing a distinct unit of bibliographic information. So title is an attribute. The words representing the title attribute make up the title element. This makes Song of Solomon a title element. Song of Solomon is the text string representing the attribute of title. Okay. So relationships, which are central to RDA, um, fill sections five through 10. These are the three parts then, as we've discussed real quickly, of the Ferber data model. Entities, relationships between entities, and the attributes of both. That gets us to the Ferber model in RDA. Now, RDA also includes many opportunities for catalogers' judgment. Among the options are here on the right, alternatives, optional additions, optional omissions, and exceptions. These are identified within the RDA toolkit by green text. Alternatives offer variations of practice which a cataloger may choose to follow. There's an example at RDA 1.7.1. This is the take what you see alternative that we will discuss in more detail shortly. Optional additions offer the cataloger the option to add information as at, AD, at RDA 2.3.1.6 where a variant title might be added. Optional omissions allow for information to be omitted as in RDA 2.4.1.4 where words in a statement of responsibility might be omitted. Words such as honorifics and initials of societies, dates of founding, things of that nature. And finally, exceptions. Expect exceptions supply specific conditions under which the preceding guideline does not apply, as in RDA 2.4.1.4, where an exception appears regarding serials. I've tried to include the RDA um, numbers here so that if you have the toolkit available to you or a copy of RDA available, you can then go back and look these up for more information later if you wish. Along with the options, there are statements of practice for the Library of Congress and the program for cooperative cataloging. 
These policy statements are used as guidance for practice by many institutions. And they might well say, in this case, we have an LCPCC policy statement next to this optional omission. It might well say, don't use this optional omission. So if you're attempting to follow best practice, it pays to pay attention to these little green banners marked LCPCC PS and to read them before you use the option that's available to you. Okay, with these exceptions in mind, and ever aware of LCPCC practice, let's return to our early example and take a look at how we ended up with such different representations of the 245 subfield B and subfield A from the very same title page. So under RDA, a mark record with any of these four variations on the right in the 245 could represent the title page on the left transcription practices in RDA and the decision to include optional elements make these variations possible. And if that doesn't complicate copy cataloging, I'm not sure what does. So the first example is a result of the RDA transcription practice, take what you see. In transcribed elements, such as the title proper and other title information, you may take what you see. In this case, the result is a 245 subfield A all in capital letters and other title information having initial capital letters on nouns, as you see here. The take what you see option appears in an LCPCC policy statement relating to RDA 1.7.1 first alternative. And that's a mouthful. We'll see later that take what you see is not restricted to capitalization. In this example, that's what we're talking about. But take what you can see can mean much more. This particular section of RDA also allows the use of in-house guidelines, so there's lots of room for flexibility in catalogers judgment. The second example is the sentence case capitalization practice familiar from AACR2. Capitalize the first word in the title, capitalize geographic regions and things of that nature. In RDA, LCPCC prefers this sentence case practice over take what you see. So this example represents both the AACR2 and RDA LCPCC representation of this title page on the left. This comes from RDA 1.7.2, which refers you to Appendix A. And in Appendix A, A.4.1 talks about capitalizing the first word, and A.13.1 talks about the geographic regions. The last two examples involve variations in transcription practices, take what you see, for the, first and for the first and sentence case for the second. Both also involve something more. As you can see, the subfield B other title information is entirely missing from both of these. This is a result of recording only the title proper because other title information is optional in RDA. Just let me note, this is not preferred by LCPCC, but it is something that's valid under RDA. This screen has a couple of snips from RDA. At the top, we have RDA 2.3 title element and RDA 2.3.4 other title information at the bottom. Now in RDA, some elements are more important than others and are called core elements. The title up here at the top, you see core element in blue text under title. These elements are considered the minimum for a bibliographic description. Title proper is a core element, and other titles are optional, as you can see from the blue text here under title and core element. However, an LCPCC policy statement makes other title information core for monographs, as you can see in the snip at the bottom. Of the four variations we've looked at, this one outlined in red represents LCPCC practice and would be the practice that most of us would follow. But all of these four variations, let me stress, all four of these are valid under RDA and all represent the exact same title page that you see on the left. And you may very well see records representing all four of these representations. Keep in mind that differences in capitalization, all capital letters versus sentence case, do not affect retrieval in a search. So how much attention or how much importance you're going to place on whether or not you use a record where you have all caps is totally a local decision, but it doesn't affect your retrieval at all. Differences in completeness in these other examples 
including other title versus excluding other title. This has a definite impact on retrieval. And this is part of the reason why the LCPCC practice wants both the subfield A and the subfield B, it wants both title proper and other title information. So let's take a look at variations in the statement of responsibility. We'll use this title page on the left to Scoundrel Time by Lillian Hellman. Now here we have two statements of responsibility on this one title page. We have the author, Lillian Hellman, and we have an introduction written by Gary Wills. Under RDA, only a first statement of responsibility relating to the title proper is core. Others are totally optional. That would result in the first example by Lillian Hellman, period. But there's also an LCPCC policy statement at 2.4.2 that encourages the recording of all statements of responsibility, resulting in the more familiar second example where we have an extended subfield C that includes both Lillian Hellman and Gary Wills. So LCPCC encourages including all statements of responsibility. So while both of these 245s, uh, 245 subfield Cs are valid under RDA, and both represent the same title page on the left, the second is preferred by LCPCC. In this example, we have seven people, all listed together at the top of the title page there, outlined in red, all performing the same function. There's no differentiation between one over the other. There's no typography that says this person's more important than another. All seven, all performing the same function. Under our ACR2, this invoked the rule of three. More than three persons performing the same function omit all but the first, use the mark of omission, followed by et al, meaning and others, in square brackets. And you've probably seen your share of records that look just like this. But under RDA, there's an optional omission at RDA 2.4.1.3 where the idea of a rule of three takes on a different slant. If you have more than three people performing the same function in a statement of responsibility, as we do here, then you may omit any but the first name, but you must indicate the omission by summarizing, and six others is used in this case, and indicating the summary comes from outside the resource by enclosing it in square brackets. You can choose a number or you can spell out the number. Let me note, this is not preferred. It's an option, but it's not preferred. Here at the top, I've got the um, statement of responsibility as a SNP. An LCPCC policy statement at the optional omission says generally, do not omit names. In effect, list them all. So this would be the disappearance of the AACR to rule of three. And this is the preferred practice. So what you have is what you list. So here are the options again. All are allowed. All would be valid records. All would describe the title page that we looked at earlier. But this one outlined in red is preferred. List them all. Here's a title page with two statements of responsibility. And this should start to be making a pattern for you. We have multiple names in both statements. The first statement includes five names, so it's more than three. The second statement includes two names. Based on what we've already seen, how many, how many variations can you imagine? And which variation do you think will be preferred? It follows the pattern that we've developed over these past several examples. Now, taking into account that you have the option to spell out or to use the number, um, I've restricted just to the number here for the omissions. So without including both spelled out in numbers, Here's four possible variations, and they're not the only ones, but here's four probably of the more prominent ones and ones you might see. In the first variation, the first statement is shortened to the first name only using the optional omission, and the omission is summarized. The second statement of responsibility is not recorded. It's optional, so it's just not there. In the second variation, the first statement is treated as above, but the second statement of responsibility is included. And since there are fewer than three names, both editors are recorded. The third variation, all names in the first statement of responsibility are recorded. The second statement of responsibility is treated as optional, so it's just not there. And finally, in the fourth variation, we have all names and all statements. So we get everybody on the page into the same subfield C. 
Now, of course, the preferred is all statements and all names. That's the one that's preferred by LC PCC practice. Now, keep in mind generally that RDA, the general direction of RDA is to record more rather than less information. So if you're going to err on the side of anything and you want to be RDA-ish, um, then you probably want to include more rather than less. So let me stress again that all of these options for recording multiple statements of responsibility and multiple names within a statement are allowable. They're valid under RDA and all describe that same resource on the left. All of them might appear in bibliographic records. Hopefully you're not seeing that many duplicate records, but who knows? So I'd like to highlight another variation by looking at the addition statement. Here we have a rather lengthy one, and it's kind of small. So let me bring it up close and personal. Third edition, completely revised and enlarged. Now the addition statement is transcribed. Under AACR2, we used abbreviations, and changing of numbers is words to numbers. So we end up with that first example third ED completely rev and in lol. I'm not sure how you would say that, but ENL period. Under RDA, take what you see applies to transcribed elements, and the addition statement is transcribed, so you take what you see. The result is that RDA records will lack some familiar abbreviations. You don't see addition abbreviated to ED period in this statement, so you don't transcribe ED period. Also do to take what you see, you can end up with the initial capitals in all words as it appears on the title page. Or we can follow the LCPCC practice and end up with the sentence case example at the bottom. This would be the preferred transcription practice we discussed earlier. But again, both of these at the bottom are valid under RDA. As to lack of familiar abbreviations, this isn't just in transcribed elements, but it's overall. Here you can see in physical description and bibliographic notes, these are not transcribed elements. But here you can see that the 300 and 504 lack familiar abbreviations of P period for pages and ILL for illustrations. So even when you're not transcribing, we're not getting involved in abbreviations. Let's take a look at publication statements. On this title page, the publication statement appears at the bottom, outlined in red. It includes the publisher's name and four cities and a date of publication, an actual date of publication. I had to look hard for that. Up here at the top, up close and personal, we have this statement from the bottom of the title page. And here we have three possible variations based on that publication statement. First variation is based on AACR2 practice and the bottom two are based on RDA. In this example, there's no difference between the transcription of the publisher's name and the date of publication between the variations. We have only one publisher, and in RDA, that's all that's required, even if there are several. And there's an actual date of publication to use, so there's no need to rely on a copyright date. There is some variation around the place of publication, the middle example includes only the first place of publication, and under RDA 2.8.2, only the first place of publication is required. The last variation would be an RDA interpretation that includes all of the places. In RDA, there's a preference by LCPCC for the last variation, but only for rare materials. Otherwise, there's no preference. So in this case, no real stated preference by LCPCC unless you're involved in cataloging rare materials. Now the biggest difference in this example is of course the 260 field versus the 264 fields that we see in the bottom. To accommodate RDA, the mark field 264 was created. This field is now preferred for all new cataloging, regardless of whether you're using AACR2 or RDA as your content standard. You might still use the 260 if the function can't be determined. If you can't tell that you have a production company or a publisher, distributor, or a manufacturer statement, then you can go ahead and use the 260. But for new cataloging, 264 is preferred. Here's a closer look at the MARC 264 field. It was created to accommodate the new RDA elements for production, publication, distribution, and manufacturer statements all in one field and the copyright notice date. 
it illustrates some of the increased granularity in RDA over AACR2. The field allows for the coding of the type of statement by the second indicator, here outlined in red. The field is also repeatable, so you may record a separate 264 for each of these types of statements if you wish, or if you have the information available, or if you're required by instructions in RDA. So as we all know, most or many publications don't include an actual date of publication. Here, scoundrel time includes no date of publication, but this inset on the lower left is from the TP Verso, and here we have a copyright date of 1976. In ACR2, lacking a date of publication, the copyright date could be used as a substitute with a C to represent the copyright symbol. Under RDA LC PCC policy statement at 2.8.6.6, when you lack a date of publication, supply a date of publication that corresponds to the copyright date in square brackets. So here we have a 264 with a second indicator of 1 for a statement of publication. The subfield C records the publication date as 1976 based on the copyright date and enclosed in square brackets to indicate that you're supplying it. The second 264 field with a second indicator of 4 is a copyright date. Only the subfield C is used in a 264 with a second indicator 4. Supplying this second 264 for copyright is optional when you have a date of publication or have a supplied date of publication. So once again that 264 with copyright is optional. So what you can end up with is a pair of 264s or a single 264 for publication information. You would never have just a 264 for copyright date, copyright alone. That would not be something that you would want to see. Also in the publication statement, under AACR2, if you had no place of publication, you substituted SL or sign loco, meaning without place. If you had no name of publisher, you used SN, sign nominee, without a name. In RDA, these are not only is there a lack of preference for abbreviations in RDA, but a lack of preference for Latin, which is okay by me. I never really studied Latin, and I've always had trouble pronouncing it. Again, both of these examples could represent the same resource. RDA is using place of publication not identified and publisher not identified for the same situations that we had SL and SN in AACR2. So when the place of publication isn't apparent from the piece that you have, RDA would like you to use place of publication not identified. But the preferred practice is to supply a known or probable place. Here, the United States is supplied in the second example, so it's enclosed in square brackets. The question mark indicates that this place is probable, not known. Known would be indicated simply by supplying United States without a question mark. So supplying a probable or known place of publication is preferred over place of publication not identified. Similarly, RDA calls for the use of publisher not identified when no publisher is listed, but the preferred practice is to supply a name from anywhere in the resource or from outside the resource if you can find it. If you can find nothing, don't supply a guess, don't supply a probable, you would still use publisher not identified. Again, note that both of these examples could represent the same resource. In the bottom one, we found, a supply, we found the publisher's name elsewhere from outside the resource. All right, the ACR2 example includes both information on the publisher, or more properly, it informs you that there is no information on the publisher, and a second statement after the first um, semicolon there that provides information on binding and printing, the manufacturer of the resource. In an RDA record, if you're missing publisher information, as in the first 264 here, expect to see another 264 field with further information. And here we have a second 264 with second indicator 3 
for information about manufacturer. This would be the RDA method of expressing the manufacturer information contained in the 260 field above. Note that the data is in square brackets, meaning it's supplied. The third 264 with second indicator 4 for information about copyright, note the use of the copyright symbol. Again, this is optional. Um, and re also remember that that 264 with a second indicator of 4, you use only the subfield C. In this case, the 1 260 field and the 3 264 fields could represent the same source. So there are some variations on the theme as to whether you would find 260s or 264 fields. The 260 field remains valid and some will continue to use it. And it can still be useful where there's not enough information to determine the function of a company. LC and PCC practice is to use the 264 field for all new cataloging. You might also see records that include both the 260 field and one or more 264 fields. Hopefully these are going to be older records where a 264 field has been added to the record. New RDA records will not have both 260 and 264 fields. And again, let me just note the use of the copyright symbol. Okay, let me take a quick, quick drink. Physical description. Here are some examples of 300 fields. In ACR2, the use of square brackets in extent, subfield A, indicated that the pages were unnumbered but counted. Under RDA, there are no abbreviations and no square brackets in the 300 field. Unnumbered pages are indicated by saying that they are unnumbered. It seems pretty straightforward. CM is considered a symbol for centimeters, not an abbreviation, so it's not followed by a period. Now here are some examples of 300s under RDA. Note that there are no abbreviations, no square brackets. CM is not an abbreviation, so there's no period. Just to give you some examples, here we're seeing unnumbered pages indicated. Of course, color and illustrations are spelled out. Pages are spelled out. One volume is spelled out, um, unpaged in parens. That's not different. And no periods after CM. Now, because this does come up frequently as a question, there are times when CM in a 300 field, subfield C, is followed by a period and times when it's not and you might have thought that this was just random chance, but it's not. The CM must be followed by a period when CM ends the 300 field and the 300 field is followed by a 490. This is due to ISBD punctuation. A 490 field must be preceded by a period. If the 300 field is followed by a 490, the 300 field must end in a period. This has nothing to do with whether or not CM is an abbreviation. It has to do with whether or not a 490 follows a 300. But I really don't think, in the scheme of things, this doesn't affect retrieval in any way if you're searching for CM for some reason in a record. But also, beyond that, I'm not sure that this is a reason I would spend time going back and either taking out a period or putting a period in, but clearly that's a local decision. RDA does not use general material designations at all. Now, catalogers of print monographs, we didn't use them in AACR2, so we wouldn't notice them. Uh, we just really wouldn't notice that the GMD wasn't there because it never has been there. So as an example, I've used a 245 here um, for an electronic resource so that you can see what it looks like when that subfield H is missing in the 245. So the ebook record in the 245 AACR2 example has that subfield H electronic resource and the same 245 below in RDA has no subfield H between the subfield A and the subfield B in the 245. Instead, you're going to find further down the record, there's a trio of new mark fields, 336, 337, and 338. And these three fields have caused a whole lot of joy. So these three RDA elements are used for all resources. There are three new elements that are applied to all resources, and new fields were created in MARC to accommodate this, uh, these elements. And here's just a little, nice little capsule of the name of the element, the MARC field, the RDA guideline, and a brief definition. And these definitions are whoppers. So here we've got content type, a fundamental form of communication in human sense, which perceives it. 
Okay, that's pretty cool. Then we have media type, a general type of intermediation device required to access content to the resource. And finally, carrier type, format of the storage medium and housing of carrier in combination with type of intermediation device. Okay, I'm lost. So let's take a look at some of the terms that actually get used in these fields um, with the hope that this might, uh, some actual examples um, might help explain just a little bit what these um, three fields are about. So content type, remember, should be a fundamental form of communication. So here we have a computer program, performed music, sounds, still image, text, two-dimensional moving images. These are all terms that would be used in content type. Media type is the general type of intermediation device required to access the content. So in order to access the content of a computer program, you would need what? You would need a computer. Um, so under media type, we have terms such as audio, computer, microform, projected, video, unmediated. Oh, I got video twice. Okay. Um, yeah, it really only needs to be there once, but okay. So then for carrier type, that's the format of the storage medium and the housing. So what these other pieces go into, what the content goes into, what the media goes into is an audio cartridge, a computer disc, a microfilm roll, a film cassette, a flip chart, a volume, or a video cassette. So hopefully that helps just a little bit. And here's a capsule of the field itself. Um, all, of, all of these fields, all three of these fields, have these three subfields, A, B, and C, or A, B, and 2, sorry. Um, and you can use A and B both, or you can use only A or only B, it's up to you, but you always must have that subfield two indicating the source. So here at the bottom, uh, towards the bottom is an example of the way you would represent a book. This is a printed book, it's a text, it's unmediated, doesn't require any equipment to get at it, and it's, a, it's represented in a volume. So per PCC, per the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, the GMD will remain on non-RDA records until March 31st, 2016, and they're going to start disappearing. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see what happens once we get there. The series statement is the last piece of description that we're going to cover. AACR2 uses abbreviations and substituted Arabic numerals for Roman numerals. RDA uses no abbreviations, no abbreviations and prefers the numbering as it appears on the source. And so here at the top, I have in red outlined this series statement um, from a title page. And here we see that the preferred is to represent fascicle without abbreviating as we would in ACR2 and to use the Roman numerals as opposed to the Arabic numerals. And again, as with all these others, both of these are valid. Both of these RDA options are valid. So, so far we've discussed the variation in description caused by using different data content standards and due to options provided in RDA. Different guidelines, different records, not too surprising, but hopefully this is explained just a little bit. Next, let's focus on relationships. Let's focus on that relationship portion of the Ferber entity relationship model. And here we, again, we have a little diagram. So here we have a, a title page for Graven Images. What's the relationship? In describing the relationship between Graven Images and Alan I. Ludwig, what is that relationship? It's not a trick question. Ludwig is the author of Graven Images. It's that simple. But what do we do with that relationship? RDA Chapter 19 describes this relationship as in the creator element. It's uh, RDA Chapter 19.2. The creator element is the person, family, or corporate body responsible for the creation of a work. Here we have um, our little uh, entity relationship diagram where we have entity graven images with the relationship created by with Alan Ludwig. So in Mark, we represent this in one of the 1XX fields, in the main entry fields. Alan Ludwig goes in a 100, a personal name field. In RDA, this is covered under providing an authorized access point, RDA 18.4.1.2, and there there are references to sections that are appropriate to the entity, person, family, or corporate body. So here we have our earlier title page with seven creators and no principal responsibility. How does RDA handle this? So in RDA 19.2, it also covers when you have more than one creator with no principal responsibility 
indicated. Only the first is required, and that first in mark is recorded in a 100 field, in a main entry field, and is represented by the authorized form of the name. Once the first name creator is recorded, the cataloger is free to provide others according to cataloger's judgment. So a record might have a 100 field and no 700 fields, or it might have a 100 field and one or several 700 fields representing the additional creators depending on the cataloger's judgment. It's totally up to you how many access points you provide. Families and corporate bodies may also be considered creators, and here's an example of a conference proceedings from a named conference, the title page on the left. For the conference to be considered a creator, it follows pretty much the same determinations that we followed in ACR2. It must be responsible for originating, issuing, or causing to be issued this volume of proceedings on the left. And the work must fall into at least one of the categories listed at RDA 19.2.1.1.1. The list is very familiar if you've worked with ACR2. There's some new language and a new category. This particular work falls into the category of reporting the collective action of a conference. So the meeting would re receive an authorized access, access point as a creator, and this would be a 111 field. RDA also has a provision for other persons, families, or corporate bodies to be associated with a work in a relationship other than a creator. So there's a list of relationships. And in the title page example on the left, outlined in red, we have three corporate bodies listed as sponsors of the work. Under this rule, 19.3.1.1, they would qualify for authorized access points. Since they are other than creators, they would be recorded in a mark 700 field as added entries as opposed to main entry. So not creators, don't go in the 100, or the 1XX in this case, would be a 110. RDA Chapter 20 deals with the relationship illustrated by this entity relationship diagram. Modeling and optimism, optimization, sorry, has editors Piccoli and Rascal, or Rascally maybe. So these two persons are associated with the group one entity modeling and optimism in the relationship of being editors. Now this is a relationship, considered a relationship with an expression. And RDA covers this as contributor. The element that takes care of this relationship is contributor. And it's defined and described under RDA 20.2. Now contributor isn't core under RDA, it's optional. It's core for LC if it's an illustrator of a work for children. For PCC, it's recorded if it's considered important. So considered important is a cataloger's judgment. In MARC, editors would appear in 700 fields as added entries. In this situation, you might record none of the editors, one of the editors, or both of the editors, and all variations would, again, be describing the same resource. A, a real quick tour through uh, relationship designators. These are covered in Chapter 18. A designator indicates the nature of the relationship between the resource and a person, family, or corporate body associated with that resource. So it's discussed in Chapter 18. It's not core. The information about the relationship can come from any source. The relationship designator, the actual term to be used, comes from a list in Appendix I. If you can't find a term that's appropriate, you can use a term not in the list, but try to use one from the list first and it's added to an identifier or authorized access point. So here's an example of one added to an authorized access point. So it goes in a subfield E in MARC, and from the list at RDA 1.2.1, we have artist, author, cartographer, we have a lot of terms. Um, in this case, author fits, author's the one we use, just note that the subfield E in this 100 field, the subfield E is not part of the authorized access point. You'll not find it in the authority file. And at least part of the reason is because Alan Ludwig, or sorry, Ludwig Allen, <laughs> might at some point be an artist or a cartographer on a different resource. So the subfield E relationship designators are added to an authorized access point in a record. They are not part of the authorized access point. All right, relationship designated for other persons, families, or corporate bodies. This is covered in RDA 1.2.2, our earlier example of the National Audubon Society, et cetera. Um, these get sponsoring body 
um, it's among the list that's in I, I'm sorry, I.2.2. And contributors. Um, contributors covers editors. So RDA I.3.1 um, gets us to editors. Again, these are not creators, these are contributors, and so they go into a 700 field, not a 100 field. In this case, Scoundrel Time, we have an, we have an author, he wrote the introduction, but he's not the author of the book. He wrote a piece that's in the book. So RDA 20.2 provides several examples of the provider of an introduction, commentary, notes, etc. as a contributor. If you, do if you do decide to provide an authorized access point, remember that this is optional for contributors. You don't have to. What's, what designator would you use in this case? And it's the editor designation that fits in this case. In I.3.1, we have the definition person, family, or corporate body contributing to an expression, contributions may include adding an introduction. There we go. So Gary Wills goes in a 700 field because he's not a creator, and he gets a subfield E editor should you decide to provide relationship designators because they are optional. Very quickly, hybrid records. These are non-RDA records with RDA elements added. Uh, this is all legal and copacetic. Um, you would spell out words in non-transcribed fields only, so pages, illustrations, no period on CM. In transcribed fields, you leave abbreviations alone because that's a transcribed field. Without the book in hand, and you shouldn't be making these changes without the book in hand, you wouldn't know that third ED period doesn't appear on the title page. And finally, you can add the three, three X fields. Um, there are other changes and additions that you can make to non-RDA records um, to create hybrids, and these are covered in a guidelines from PCC, and I would encourage you to look those over. Here are some recommended resources, um, things that I've used myself and that I highly recommend. One of the things that you sh I should caution you with with RDA, since it is a living, breathing document and is updated regularly, there was a big update that went in in April of this year, um, you should always look for the most current. Uh, and the oldest thing on here is Robert Maxwell's uh, 2008 Ferber, A Guide for the Perplexed. I really highly recommend that if you are perplexed and want to know more about Ferber. And finally, um, let me mention uh, the Lex resources that are available to you, the upcoming webinars and web courses, uh, there's a link, the webinar archive, take a visit, see if there's a topic there that interests you, or the YouTube, the YouTube channel, there's those. Finally, if you're getting anything out of the work that Alex is doing, I encourage you wholeheartedly, please, to support the work of Alex by joining. If you're an ALA member already, um, it's very simple. Um, if not, you join ALA and join Alex when you do. So please consider that. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. And this is Mika, my wonder dog, um, wanting to know if you have any questions or comments. So Eva, could you? Uh... Um. Yeah, Vicki, can you advise on a good resource for ISBD punctuation? I've been using www.loc.gov slash mark slash bibliographic, but it's inconsistent and doesn't adequately explain why. Uh, for some of the older cataloging, you're going to need to go back to um, earlier ISBD versions. ISBD came out in several, um, it came out by format. Uh, there was a uh, monograph, there was a, I think there was a serial, there were several, and then there was a consolidated. I've got a link um, for the consolidated ISBD, um, and I'm not sure that it's the one that you're using, so I can make that available. I don't have it um, with me at the moment, but yeah, um, I've, for some of my research, I've actually gone back to some of the original ISBD publications to find explanations. But this thing about the 490 field followed the, you should be able to find that um, in the ISBD consolidated. But let me provide a link for that in the answers to questions. Okay, do we also need to spell out states in the 264? Um, is this a state that's on the title that's you're transcribing? Yes. If it's if it's spelled out on the piece that you're cataloging, you reflect that. You take what you see. If it's spelled out there, you spell it out. If it's not spelled out, you don't spell it out. 
if it is spelled out, you don't abbreviate it. Don't abbreviate. That's transcribed information. Okay, from a supervisor's point of view, um, my observation has been that most staff want less options, not more. Have you found it harder <laughs> to train catalogers under RDA than it was in, under AACR2? Um, I tell you, the one thing that I find, uh, part of the reason why the early part of this presentation talks about Ferber and talks about the transition between the two, and part of the reason why I've cited RDA um, guideline numbers is because I find it's a lot easier for people to utilize catalogers judgment if they get the opportunity to build catalogers judgment and part of that is knowing where the information is and how to get at it if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing then you can't make judgments about things you're going to do in the future so I'm a real strong believer in giving people a basis in fundamentals not not just a procedure to follow but an understanding of why the procedure goes the way it goes. It takes a little bit longer in initial training, but it allows somebody to develop that catalogers judgment if they know where to go to get the answers to their own questions. Okay, doesn't allowing so many options make it hard for libraries to standardize records? Do you think that's important or is it just part of catalogers type A personalities? <laughs> How many discussions over the decades have we all gotten involved in and whether or not that period after the CM is really important? Um, there are times and days when that has been very important because that's the way that our systems or our data searching parsed out some of the information. I mean, without ISBD punctuation, it's impossible in a raw mark record to find some of the information. But in a world where we're converting things to XML and uh, we're searching for them on the web and we're, we're creating linked data structures for our bibliographic information, that type of thing is less and less important. What becomes more important um, when we take that information and bring it down into like a 336 field is one single facet of format. It's not, it's not a phrase in a subfield H that covers not just format but media and content. Otherwise, you know, it covers everything in a subfield H. In a, 360, in a 336, 337, and 338, we're breaking out particular facets into very granular information. That's when you want standard language. And in those fields and in several other instances, there's standard language. There seems to be a lot of options, but there's also lists of terms to use for some of these things. There's lists of terms for relationship designators. There's uh, particular relationships that are defined and others aren't. So, and so you fit them into the relationships that are defined. So yes, there's more choice. It can lead to more variation, but like as we did in the past, we're waiting for LCPCC and other organizations. We're developing the practice. Let's face it, we have decades of practice through AACR to AACR2 and revisions, et cetera. We have decades of practice that went into the LCRIs, the Library of Congress rule interpretations. Many of those rule interpretations were included wholesale into the writing of the text of RDA. But where things have developed in the use of RDA, that have highlighted things that needed to change or needed to be clarified, they've actually been updated and changed in RDA. The RDA that you look at today is not the RDA that came out in 2013. There have been changes. By the same token, and it's cleaned it up considerably and made it much easier to get more standard practice out of it. And at the same time, LC and PCC have continued to expand um, what they've contributed as practice. All of this, we're going to get better at it as time goes by, as we develop more preference for certain kinds of practices and they're going to be stated, uh, things are going to get more standard. But yeah, face it, we're in a period of transition. Um, there are going to be all these variations and probably more um, that are going to be available. So educate, keep in touch with the changing and the updates of the standards and see where it goes. Okay, thank you. I think that's all our time for questions. Oops. Thank you, Vicki, for your engaging webinar on the basics of cataloging with RDA. Thank you to all our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful. 
you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the Elect CE Committee plan new continuing education offerings. Information about all Elect's webinars can be found on the Elect's homepage. Please check out our web courses and upcoming e-forums. Suggestions for webinars and other continuing educational opportunities are welcome at any time. Please contact any member of the ELEC CE committee or submit a proposal for a webinar using the online form on the ELEC's webpage under online learning. I would like to thank Wanda Jalzieri and A. Ping Chen Gaffey for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support they and their colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other Alex continuing education offerings again in the future.